month, a time for this, a time for that, yeah. a time. Listen, they stole that from Ecclesiastes. That's yes, right. <laughs> right? And so I recognize as the carnal mind or as the wisdom of the world is unwound in people, they can walk through different seasons, quote unquote, if we want to use that terminology. But the, one of the things that I don't want to say it's a fear, but one of the things I'm mindful of is I hope at the end of the day, the way people are hearing the grace that's being taught is leading them into a place where they're having more fellowship with God, not less. Right. Do you, yeah. Like grace isn't supposed to lead you into the place where you say, well, I don't, I'm not going to sit with God. I'm not going to do that. Da, da, da. I'm not going to do. That's not where grace will lead you. Now, if you've been entrenched in religion for so long, you could find yourself there for a little while. Yes. Right. right. Where you disengage from everything. Yeah. But ultimately, where the grace will take you is like a constant fellowshipping with God. A constant desire. Notice I said desire, not lust. A constant desiring to share life with God. Right? Where you find yourself sharing life with God in everything that you're doing. Listen, I I just got to tell everybody. You can desire for different things in your life. And you can desire for your life to go somewhere. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I'll tell you this. If you find your heart connecting with the fact that you're sharing life with God. Wherever it is you're at. You'll find great contentment there. While you're there. It doesn't mean you won't walk away from there at some point. It just means you'll find great contentment. Wherever you're at, as you're walking through, instead of finding yourself feeling tormented about where you're at. Because God is like the great equalizer. You know what I'm saying? So it don't matter where you're at or what you're doing. If you find your heart sharing life with God in that place, you will find that causing you to feel contentment. You'll find it filling you with joy. You're fulfilling your desire. Right, right. (laughs) You'll find that God is so much that He actually possesses the ability to fill you full. He's actually the only thing that can fill you full. Amen. Right? And no matter where you're at, He's there with you. And so the Gospel is designed to open your eyes to that reality, God with you, and that you find yourself enjoying life because you're sharing it with God no matter what you're doing. Listen, when Jesus was busy making tables and chairs, He wasn't thinking... When will I be able to be the savior of the world? <laughs> this making chairs and tables, man, it stinks. I was meant for so much more. That's right. <laughs> do, you, do you see what I'm saying? He got a splinter. Did he heal himself? Right. Do, do, you see what, do you see what I'm saying with that? Why was it, Jesus was very content making tables and building a chair. Why? Because he was fellowshipping and sharing life with God in those moments. That didn't mean his heart wasn't filled with, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. <laughs> That's right. right? Yeah. It just means that the desire wasn't a lust. He didn't despise himself for making the tables and the chairs. He didn't despise where he was at. Because God was there with him, and they were sharing life even there. And so he found great value even there. Yeah. He wasn't thinking there would be more value over here. He was thinking, ah, there's so much value in sharing life with the Father. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, and Greg, if, 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 if your life is going to go somewhere, in other words, if the activities of your life are going to change, it, it's better for it to be driven by this like natural flow that comes from your just being who you are, where you're at, than pursuing to find something else. Because you're always looking for something else to make you happy. Yeah. That's what everybody is. Yeah. You know? The, this, this whole kind of everybody is, tends to be. The grass is always greener. It's yes. that saying. The grass is greener. The grass is greener. But notice how the, Psalm 23 said that He maketh us to lie down in the tender green grass. The place where the grass is greener is fellowshipping with Father yeah. right. through the Spirit yeah. as son and daughter. Right. That's the place where the grass is the greenest. Guess right. what? You can do that wherever you're at. Mm-hmm. Right. Right? Yes. Sorry, Cindy. Like I used to say when I felt I had to sit down at my desk and do a, you know, like a formal quiet time every day. And then in my mind, I'm thinking, if I just get through with this, then I can do what I really want to do. <laughs> and then oh, I started, yeah. and then I started going out in the garage and, you know, working with wood. 
and doing all the things I love to do and fellowshipping with God while I was doing it. Yeah. It was like, aha, now, now you're talking. This is way better because I could do both at the same time. Yeah. I didn't have to force myself to sit at my desk. That's right. I don't sit still very good. No. And it, listen, that will change. That begins to t- tear down your preconceived notions and biases about prayer or what it means to hang out with God, right? Because it doesn't have to just be like where you go off in a prayer closet, right? Is what they call it. It can be that way, but it doesn't have to be that way. You find yourself doing it all the time. That's the place where you'll find the most joy, right? If you're walking in the Spirit, you're never not in a prayer closet. That's right. That's right. Yesterday, Greg, I was looking at some apartments, and, you know, I'm in a situation that's going to be tough. It's just the way it's going to be. But it's okay. Yesterday, I wasn't okay. But this morning, I woke up, and I thought of the places that I had looked at, and, and I heard a still small voice say, be the light. It's going to be okay. No matter where it is, it doesn't matter where I live. God's going to be with me through it. Yeah. And maybe I'll be somebody's little bit of sparkle of hope in their life. Yeah. There's been some, some places I was looking at, and I'm like, oh my gosh, these poor people. Uh, they're hurting more than I am. Yeah. And so it was kind of neat this morning that I woke up that, you know, the situation hasn't changed, but my attitude has. Yeah. And I can be grateful for that. And ideally, what will happen is you'll realize God's the light everywhere you go. Right. Be the light can make you feel better from day to day. But God will take you to the place where you're not like this every day. You mean the pogo stick of life? Yeah. The pogo stick of life is, is not the life of a son or a daughter. That doesn't mean you, don't go, you can't go through that. It doesn't mean to despise yourself if you're going through that. But I'm not going to create a theology in my head that leaves me going through that. Right. What I'm going to do is allow God to keep walking me through right life and then straightening out the hills and the valleys right because i don't know if you're always going uphill and you think you're always going uphill and you're living like you're always going uphill listen the suffering eventually will make you crack it's like what they say in the tour de france i don't know if you guys watch watch the tour de france but when i got injured and i couldn't run anymore i started looking for the next best place you could really suffer and I thought, <laughs> it's the tour That's de France. Like cycling is it. Yes. Those guys Absolutely. are really suffering, man. Yes. And I thought, I'll go suffer with them. You know? But they, you know, so I'm watching this. I watch it every year, and it's funny. But they, you know, these English guys talking, you know, they're yeah, riding up Alpe d'Huez, and it's like 12% gradient on their bikes. And they have a funny saying where when a guy is done, he cracked. <laughs> you know, he cracked. He's done. And you just see everybody else tooling away from him. If all we live is like this, eventually we're going to crack. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so it's awesome to, to think of a different perspective because having a different perspective can save us. Like what, what you just said, Sherry, that be the light or other people have it worse than me. That, that can bring relief, but that can never bring permanent salvation. Right? right. And I'll take relief when you need relief. But let your eyes be open for permanent salvation from that thing. Right? Because God is the light. Right, And so your salvation, wherever you're at, isn't that you can be somebody else's light. That, that's like you saving yourself. And that can bring relief, and there's nothing wrong with that. So this isn't to uh, negate what you said, it's to add on to it also. Right, That can be helpful to have your perspective change. Yeah, if you're busy worrying about all this crazy stuff that uh, happens in American life, you can think about people in other countries and think, my goodness, I'm like a rich person in another country. Right, And it's like uh, poverty and wealth is not defined by the possessions you have or where you live. It's de- defined by what's in your heart. And did you guys hear Birdie tell that story about the guy in uh, Africa in the bush? Yes. Yeah. He, yeah. Sold yeah. His, yeah. he sold his tin roof to buy silverware and food to feed them dinner. And Birdie goes, where's the roof? Oh, we sold it, man, to get the dinner and the silverware. Wow. The guy out in... What? It's like immediately Bernie realized that's the richest man I've ever met. Yeah. Right? He sold the roof that he had so that he could prepare them a nice dinner. And he was happy about it. He said, oh, that's the richest guy I've ever met. And it's true. Right? That guy didn't feel any lack. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. That's what makes a person rich. See, we think other things make us rich because in our subconscious minds, we think those things will deliver us from the lack we feel. But the thing that makes a person rich is for the lack to be circumcised from their heart. It's just what will actually circumcise your heart from lack. 
We tend to think what will circumcise our hearts from lack are external things. Where we live. What our jobs are. What we have. What we can accomplish. What we can do. We tend to think all those things are what are going to deliver us from lack. But if we sit in a place where we feel lack, it ain't because those things. Do you see what I'm saying? Listen, I started off as a little boy with the desire to be in the Olympics. It was a pure desire. It quickly turned into lust. For the longest time, I, felt the, I thought the lack I felt was because I didn't do those things that I desired to do. Then I quickly realized that wasn't the lack that I felt. And those things could never satisfy my soul. Right? That put me to rest. I stopped chasing after a thing through lust. Right? And I started fellowshipping with God. I started finding myself filled full. Right? Then my, guess what magically started happening? I mean, after I screwed off the running thing and, you know, was a, a drunkard and a drug addict for so long. After I did that for a while and I come to the place where, woe is me, look what I've done to my life. And I asked my dad if he thought I could have been in the Olympics. And he says, oh, of course, man, you could have done it. And so then in my mind, I thought, I can, I'm not too old yet. I'm 19. Peaking for distance running is like 30 something. And I immediately started going after it. But what I realized is that I was going after it to satisfy the lack I felt. That's what was behind it. I thought that the good report of Greg was found in him being able to accomplish this thing. And when I, could, when I didn't accomplish the thing, I felt so much lack that I tried to self-medicate. And then when I realized that self-medication wasn't satisfying my soul, I went back to, can I still do that? And there was still time. So then I went after that with everything in me. I still felt all the lack. Right? And then towards the end of that, I realized that could never satisfy my lack. It wasn't that running is evil. It wasn't that training is evil. It wasn't that discipline is evil. It wasn't that it was evil to go after the thing. It was the thought that that will satisfy my lack. Right? And the fact that I was lusting after it instead of fellowshipping with God and just running, that ran me into the ground and actually prevented me from being able to do what was in my heart to do. Right? Because God come and tell me right at the beginning, just run. But I had already decided I had a limited amount of time. I had to accelerate the training. I had to accelerate. I can suffer more than them all. And so I'll suffer more than everyone. And I'll just accelerate that thing. And through the course of accelerating that thing, God kept sending people telling me, just run. Your mind is filled with lusting after life through the running. Let your mind be clean from that and just run. Right? But I couldn't get it. So I ran myself into the ground. I bought a bunch of injuries upon myself. And, you know, had my woe is me experience. You can call it your cross experience. Where you finally really die to the life that's in the world. Mm -hmm. Because you saw the life that you could have from the world was actually killing you. (laughs) Right? You have the moment with God where the metal meets the road. And then you start feeling satisfaction in God. Right? You start feeling satisfaction in God. Now when I go run, man, I love running. I love the thing. But I'm not trying to get somewhere. Yeah. I'm not trying to be filled full. I'm doing it because I love it. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm doing it because it gives me a buzz. I'm doing it because for me, it's like I check out with God in my subconscious while I'm doing it. Right? I find He ministers to me. Mm-hmm. You see? And so now I'm doing it from a whole other platform. Before, I was doing it from, I was born with this great potential. <laughs> Look at this great ability I have. Right. Let me use this ability, and if I can use this ability, I'll end up on the podium, they'll play the national anthem, well, I'll cry, they will be on the box of Wheaties, and then that'll be the platform from where I'll have a ministry and my life will be seen to be valuable. It's like in my heart I knew my life was valuable, it's just the world came and convinced me that my value was found and I could run. <laughs> and I, what I could accomplish through my running. So that must be the same dynamic in the heart of God where God doesn't feel lack. Uh, because of the absence of man in, in, in his family, but rather out of love and passion, he's going to go after him. Bingo! That's how he could miss and not lie. That's, good. That's real good. That's a beautiful connection there. And so, the satisfaction I was yearning for is only found in God. And now I realize that. Right? And hopefully, that's what people will understand through the hearing of the Gospel. And hopefully, through hearing of the gospel, they'll find themselves, the gospel drawing them them into this face-to-face relationship with God. Where they start experiencing God wherever they are. 
because God's not busy thinking. The only way we can enjoy life is if we get away from here. No. That's not what God's thinking. God's not busy thinking, well, we could really enjoy life if we could just accomplish this or that. That's not what God's thinking. And so as the Gospel draws you into this face-to-face with God, you find that you have a well of living water on the inside of you. You have this well of water that never runs dry, that never stops, and you find yourself being satisfied wherever you're at. Right? I mean, one of the things I do with people, I think we talked about it on Thursday, so much of what we think we want or need or want to do is born from impure things. And I don't mean you're impure or evil. I mean, they're actually contrary to what's really in your heart. And so whatever, I, whatever uh, I do with people, I never tell people what to do. It's never anybody's place to tell people what to do. What I want to do is move, help them move everything out of their hearts that I see hasn't come from life, that comes from fear or from lack. I want to move these things out of their hearts that are speaking to them, that might be influencing what they think they want or what they think they want to do. Because at the end of the day, if I can move those things out of the way, they're going to be left with just a desire in their heart. And it'll be really clear, that's the thing I want. And they'll be set free to go after it. Right? We err when we try to tell people what to do. Right? As much as I may be able to discern another person's heart, I cannot discern the totality of that person's heart. I cannot discern the totality of what God has put in their heart or the authentic image of God that they are. And for me to try to now come and tell them what they should be doing is erroneous. And that's not the place of any pastor or leader or teacher. I don't care how anointed you think you are. I don't care how much of an apostle you think you are or prophet that you think you are. That's not your place. Your place is to come and remove all the things out of their heart that haven't come from above, that have been born from the life that's in the world, and then they'll see what their heart is. Ah! And then they can pursue that. Right? Because the world wants to come in. It's like we have a committee in our heads. (laughs) Right? There's like a little committee sitting around in our heads meeting like a little board. Meeting and talking about all the things. And they all have their own view and opinion and their own word. Right? And so what the gospel wants to do is remove all the opinions that come from fear. Remove all the opinions that come from lack. Remove all the opinions that come from the life that's in the world. And then you sit with a desire. Right? And then you feel great strength to go after that desire. And it becomes very clear for you. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. It's like when I was busy hating... Listen, man, I don't like public speaking. I just don't like public speaking, right? But I love to preach the gospel, right? There's been different stages of me wanting to get ye out of this country and get down off that stage. The first one was just when we moved here and we got on the stage. There's no camera, right? And you know what? All of a sudden I saw I can't hide behind anything. Here I am. I'm naked. Who's going to clothe me? Well, then I got through that. But then all of a sudden we put that camera up there. Now all of a sudden, I'm on video. It's like another Q-beam shining on me. I, I'm even more naked now. I can't hide. Then, we start live streaming the thing. Now people are watching live. I can't go back and edit it out if I think I was an ass. <laughs> now I'm really naked. But it was still okay because the, the, the camera was so blurry. Yeah. I'm still a little covered. <laughs> now we put in those freaking lights. And the nice camera. And the picture is clear, man. And there's eight bright lights shining on me. And there's really nowhere to hide now. Now I'm really naked. In each one of those instances, man, because I don't like public speaking, I felt great fear. I felt great lack. I felt great torment at what I felt on the inside about my nakedness. I just did. And there were many times where I thought, this means... I don't want to be preaching. Therefore, the only thing to do now is to stop and shut it down. I don't desire to be out in front. I don't desire a public forum. I'm content just off behind the scenes hanging out with God. I actually am. So all this fear was like, well, you don't even, you're not even trying to build a ministry. What are you doing, dude? Why are you full of this torment? Just let it go. Walk away. And I sat with God and he came and started reasoning with me about what was in my heart to show me what was actually in my heart. Because all the fear and the torment and the lack that I felt was actually clouding what was in my heart. And it was actually confusing me and making me think something was in my heart that was not. And so we come and remove the fear. And he come and removed the thoughts of lack. And he moved that all out of the way. And he sat there with me and he said, Now, Greg, what do you want to do? 
man, I want to preach. <laughs> so do you see how fear and lack in the life that was in the world was trying to, it's, it was contrary to what was actually in my heart. But it seemed so real that I thought that's what was in my heart. But it was actually against the thing that was in my heart. Right? And so the Gospel comes and removes those things from your heart. And that sets you free to not just see, but to pursue with great unction the thing that's in your heart. Where fear isn't the father or the motivator. Lack isn't the father or the motivator of what you're doing. Right? Getting somewhere isn't the father or the motivator of what you're doing. It's just, this is what I want to do. So really, what he did was glorify you. Yeah. Yeah, in my heart. Right. He cast down the accuser. To let you be you. Right. Right. To let me do what was in my heart. I would have never been happy if I would have stopped. If I would have stopped, I would have spent my whole life thinking, what did I do that for? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Right? And listen, the gospel could have delivered me from that also. The gospel is not subject to uh, you being able to pursue it without anything, and then you're going to find life through that. So it's not that I find life through this now. Do you understand? I still find life through God. I'm just explaining the dynamic of the heart. Right? And so I hope everybody can understand what I'm saying there. You know, there's many times where I'm explaining the dynamic of the heart. God's heart and our heart. That sounds different than when you're exegiting Scripture passages. God's a real person, if you understand what I'm saying. He's not some ethereal thing. He's not like some ball of energy that's filled with a bunch of mathematical equations and that's it. He's a real person. He feels things. He thinks things. He experiences things. And I think so many times we don't understand the Scriptures are telling us about God's heart and we completely lose sight of the Scriptures painting a picture of God standing there talking and what would God say? We see the cross and the resurrection and it's wonderful to see those things. And there's a big part of seeing Christ and seeing those things and understanding the things that those things mean. But ultimately, the cross and the resurrection is actually the Father standing there saying something to everyone. It's Him pouring His heart out to you. And so many times, the way we understand those things eliminates that. And so what is the Father saying there? If the Father is saying, because Jesus is the Word made flesh. He is God's language. That means God standing there talking. What is He saying? That's what we're after. What is God saying in the cross and the resurrection? Right? And you know what God's saying? You've never been without a father. You've never been an orphan. I've never forsaken you. I've never left you alone. Here I am to overcome this death that's keeping you from life. Here I am to conquer what is oppressing you. Here I am to give you strength to overcome the accusation of the evil one. And we lose that, man. In all of our doctrinal dissertations. And no one has more doctrinal dissertations than me. And so this is not to say the doctrinal dissertations are invaluable. But what we need to see is also this picture of the Father standing there. What would He say? What is He saying to us? What makes a person think they have to give themselves life? That there isn't someone to give it to them for them. So what did death do to humans? It accused us. Death is what accuses our hearts. It brings condemnation to our hearts. How does it do it? It tells us that we've been orphaned in the earth. We're without a father to clothe upon us with life. That God has forsaken us. That God has seen us in our affliction. And He's abhorred us. That's what death tells us. And then that leaves us in the place where we think we must give ourselves life. Mm -hmm. We must satisfy ourselves. Well, God sees that's what's happening to us. And He comes and shows up to tear down the accusation. And how does He tear down the accusation? He comes as mighty God, everlasting Father, wonderful Counselor. He comes and stands there and He comes and tears down the accusation. What accusation? You've been orphaned in the earth. You're bereft of a father. He comes and says, you've never been an orphan. I never turned my back on you. I've never hid my face from you. You've always had a father. I've never abhorred you because of your affliction. Look, here I am conquering your death. Here I've come to clothe upon you with my life. That tears down the accusation. 
Now I see, my goodness, it's a lie that I've been without a father. It's a lie that I've been an orphan in the earth. It's a lie. I see God as my Father. I see He's come now to clothe upon me with life. And then you find your heart calling out to God. You find your heart calling upon the name of the Lord in your time of need. You find your heart calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You receive strength from God to overcome the accusation. Because when you're clothed and a guy comes and tells you you're naked, that don't make no sense to you. I don't care what any one of you tell me today. There ain't a single one of you that's going to convince me that you see my butt crack. (laughs) Ain't a single one of you going to convince me that I'm sitting here without any clothes on. Do you know why? Because I freaking see it. You see how your accusation is powerless? What we don't understand, guys, is that there has been something standing opposed to mankind from the moment that God got down on one knee and barocked Adam. His name is Satan. And he stands opposed to mankind. And the way he opposes mankind is through death. That death accuses us and causes us to be filled with fear and shame and thinking we've got to give ourselves life. We don't call upon the name of the Lord, but we labor and toil to give ourselves life. God comes to save us from that accusation by clothing upon a human being who had our sin and our death upon us. Do you know what that tells us? We were never orphans. What? We were never bereft of a father. He never hid his face from us. Look! Now you find something in your heart where you call upon the name of the Lord. Now guess what happens? His Spirit comes and fills your heart and wraps your heart in light and life. You see yourself as clothed upon now with glory and immortality. Guess what doesn't have any power when you see that? The accusation of the evil one. His accusation has now been cast down out of your heart. And all this is going to play out at the end. When Christ returns, what did Job say? Though this, the serpent is accusing Job through all of his friends. And what did Job say? My Redeemer is alive. You know what he's saying? My life is hid in Him. His life is my life. I'm braided together with Him. And He's alive. And even should my flesh rot away from my bones, this one thing I know, because my Redeemer is alive and my life is hid in Him, I will stand on this earth before my God in glorified human flesh. That's what Job says. So in the day the Redeemer comes to stand foot on this earth, there's going to be Satan standing there resisting mankind as the sons and daughters of God. He's going to be there to stand against man as the sons and daughters of God. Now, all those who believe on the Spirit of the Son, they're going to find strength to overcome the accusation. Why? Because in that moment, we're all going to be glorified immortal. We'll see ourselves as clothed upon. The death that accuses us of not being the sons and daughters of God will have no power because we'll see ourselves wrapped in the glory and immortality of God. Amen. Listen, when you, in the day where we're standing there clothed in glory and immortality, ain't nobody going to be able to convince you you ain't the son or the daughter of God. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? That's right. That's it. It's not possible. That's it. But all those who haven't believed on the son, they're going to be standing there not clothed upon. Satan will be able to uncover their nakedness, which is what he comes to do. He'll uncover their nakedness. They won't have the Spirit of the Son in them. They won't see themselves clothed in glory and immortality, and they won't be able to overcome the accusation. Like They'll if, believe it. If you know you're a sheep, it doesn't matter if someone calls you a goat. Amen. Amen. And so that's, guys, the whole thing that played out in Genesis, it's coming again. Where Satan's going to stand there. It's called the day of temptation. Right? The temptation of the evil one. We're not going to overcome it ourselves. We're explaining it now. But the spirit of the living God that dwells in us is going to cause us to overcome. How is he going to cause us to overcome? He's going to manifest the majesty and immortality of God in our physical bodies. That's going to overcome. That's going to be the voice of the Father. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Are not they a brand that's plucked out of the fire of the second death? 
the Lord rebuke you, Satan. I've removed their iniquity and I've clothed upon them with the raiment of majesty and immortality. Right? That's how you're going to overcome the accusation in the day of the temptation. By the Spirit of the living God raising you unto glory and immortality. But all those who haven't believed on the Son, the accusation is going to ring loud in them because their nakedness is going to be uncovered. And they're going to be like the first Adam. They're going to see their nakedness. That nakedness is going to accuse them. It's going to tell them, God isn't your Father. You're an orphan in the earth. He's forsaken you. He's abhorred you in your affliction. And you're going to cower away from God in fear unto destruction to the second death. Just like Adam did. And so, there's a big part of the Gospel of God being the Father of mankind in His heart. It don't matter what... We focus so much on what other, is in other people's hearts. What's in God's heart? Can an unbeliever call upon the name of God right now? Yeah. Then guess what? That means they're not bereft of a father. Can an unbeliever call upon the name of the Lord today? Yes. Then guess what? That means they're not really an orphan in the earth. And so God would come to tear down that lie. Here I am. That's why Jesus is the representative of the human race. It's like, what did Satan accuse Jesus of? He wasn't the Son. What did He use to accuse Him? The death of the cross. Listen guys, Jesus is the last Adam. Satan isn't just resisting Jesus there. He's resisting all of mankind. He's coming against all of mankind there. That's you. God wants you to see the accusation from the outside looking in. You notice how you see things so much more clearly when you're on the outside. Mm -hmm. When someone's on the inside, they can't see anything. Right. But, and you'll be on the outside seeing it real clear, and you're like, what the hell? <laughs> Why don't they see it? That's right. <laughs> well, we couldn't see it. Yeah. And so God's like, I know. If they can see it from the outside looking in, then they can see it. And so now, here comes Jesus. The Son of God, the eternal Word, put on mortal flesh. He comes as the last Adam, the high priest of the human race, the representative of the human race. Now we can behold our lives in His face. And now we see Him stand in the face of the accusation. We see Him clothed in... Whose death is He clothed in? Ours. Whose sin is He clothed in? Ours. What's the accusation? Because of this body of sin and death, we're not the children of God. We're orphans in the earth. We've been forsaken by God. He's hid His face from us. He's abhorred us. And we've got to get busy clothing ourselves. That's what we were thinking. That's what we were thinking about Jesus. Now we're on the outside looking in. And now God comes and raises that guy up and clothes that guy with immortality. What does that say to us? Oh, that guy was never bereft of a father. That guy was never orphaned in the earth. That guy was never forsaken by God. God never abhorred him. God never hid his face from him. That guy's me. Yeah, oh my right. gosh. <laughs> Abba! Do you see the progression there? Yes. We've gotten so programmed in our idea of how the gospel should be preached. We've gotten so programmed and there's this way to preach the gospel and that's it. We don't understand God is a person if you understand what I'm saying. He has a heart. He thinks things. He feels things. He talks. He come and sit at the campfire with you and talk to you about what He feels. He can shed a tear with you. He can look in your face and tell you how it felt when He saw you suffering and He'll shed a tear. And so He sees that there's something standing against His people. He sees that there's an accusation condemning His people. And He sees the, ring, the thing that makes the accusation ring so true is the death they're clothed in. So he says, I'm going to come and I'm going to tear down the accusation. I'm going to send my son. He's going to stand in the face of the accusation for all human beings. And then we're going to tear down that accusation. So that people can see that they're not orphans in the earth. And they find something in their hearts where they call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. Right? Yep. And then they receive strength from God. Because God comes to place His name behind our names to uphold our names. Mm -hmm. But you have to allow Him to place His name behind your name. Right? And so when you call upon the name of the Lord, it means to allow yourself to be surnamed by God. And so now He comes and upholds your name with His name. In His life. And then when the accuser comes to accuse, 
It makes no sense to you. <laughs> right? And you receive strength to overcome that thing. Right? You get, does that make any sense? Do you guys see this thing about Job and about God? About what God come to do? It's throughout the whole Bible. What was Goliath doing to the children of Israel? What was he doing? He was accusing them. Who was their king when he was accusing them? Saul. Do we think they were walking in grace when he was accusing them? No. He's, but he's accusing them. He sa- it says he's defying the children of Israel as God's people. Is what Goliath is doing. You know when you go look up that word defy, you know what it means? It means to defame. It means to tear down the reputation of someone. Meaning, if the Israelites were God's people, Goliath was saying, no, you're not God's people. It means to uncover their nakedness and use their nakedness as the tool by which you come and tell them they're not God's people. So Goliath uncovered their nakedness. That word defy means to uncover someone's nakedness, to strip them down, to defame them, to tear down their reputation. And so Goliath came accusing the children of Israel of not being the people of God. And the way that he proved what he was saying to them was that he uncovered their nakedness. He pointed at their inability to overcome him. He pointed at the weakness in their flesh. If you're the God's people, send out your champion and we'll see. And so it says the Israelites were filled with fear and shame. Doesn't that sound like Adam? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Doesn't that sound like what Satan was doing to Jesus at the cross? Yes. Uncovering his nakedness? Wasn't Jesus naked? Mm-hmm. And so David comes as the advocate of the Israelites. And what does he say? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should speak against God's people? <laughs> Now who's David there? God! Coming to defend who? Us! Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this unclean person speaking unclean words about God's people? That's what God is saying. If you could see the Father standing there in the resurrection, who is this uncircumcised serpent speaking these unclean things about my people? Right? It's interesting how Israel wanted a king. God was upset with them. So he gave them a king after their own mind. Yeah. You know, and, and Saul brought them to that point. Mm-hmm. And then God says, I'm going to give Israel a king who's after my own heart. And he raises up David as a, as a kid. Amen. Amen. Listen, guys, we get so wrapped up in unbelievers and believers. God came to defend the world against the accusation. It says God so loved the world He sent Jesus. Why does He send Jesus? To stand in the face of the accusation so He could defend us against the accusation. He's come to defend everyone against the accusation, not some. Now here's the crux of the matter. To all those who believe, they will receive strength to overcome the accusation in the day of temptation or the day of scrutiny or the day of judgment or the day of atonement. Right? That's why it says Satan has been cast down from... You know why you can't accuse God anymore? Because there's a human being sitting there clothed in immortality. How are you going to tell God that man isn't his children when there's a man sitting there clothed in the majesty and immortality of God? Right. So now he's been cast down and he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's devouring all those who haven't heard the voice of God defending them against the accusation. And the revelation goes on to say, but we overcome Him by the blood of the Lamb becoming the word of our testimony. Right? What blood of the Lamb? The Lamb died. The blood ran out. He died away our death and then His skin clothed us. Mm -hmm. That becomes the testimony of our hearts. And then when Satan comes to accuse us, his accusation falls to the ground because we see ourselves as clothed. We live by faith and not by sight. Faith becomes our sight. What's our faith? Our faith is in the resurrection of Jesus. So we see Jesus clothed upon with glory and immortality. That becomes the word of our testimony. And in the day Satan comes to accuse us, we live by faith, not by the sight of our physical eyes. Our faith in the resurrection of Jesus becomes our sight. And now the accusation of the serpent has no power in our hearts. Just like it had nothing in Jesus. 
What did Jesus say? Now has come the hour. Now has come the time where the prince of this world will come to me. But he has nothing in me. What doesn't have anything in him? The accusation doesn't have anything in him. What accusation? That death you have means you're an orphan, means you're not the son of God, means God's turned his back on you, means God's forsaken you. That accusation had nothing in Jesus. Why? He lived by, with faith as his sight and not his physical eyes as his sight. So his heart was wrapped in light and life by the spirit of the living God, the spirit of life. And so when Satan came to tempt him to believe he wasn't the son, he saw himself wrapped in light and life. He saw himself braided together with the eternal one. And he knew that he was the son of God. Now, that Jesus has been raised from the dead. The same thing can be born inside of us where Satan has nothing in us. Why? Because our faith is in the resurrection. We see God come and raise the man who had our sin and our death and clothed upon him with life. That means God is telling us, you're not without a father. You're not an orphan. You're not alone. Here I am. And now when Satan comes to tell us we're alone, he has nothing in us because our faith is in the resurrection. Sure. That's the proof we're not alone. That's the proof we have a father that cares for our lives. That's the proof that if we, in the day, we feel naked. That's the proof that we have someone who will clothe upon us. That's the proof that we're not orphans. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now you start talking with God in that place, like Jesus did on the cross. Mm-hmm. Does that make any sense? Yeah. This thing happens all over the place, but I'm telling you, in the end, the serpent is going to come. He's going to be before God. We're all going to be there. You're going to be raised up unto immortality or you're going to be raised up in a body of death. All those who have believed on Jesus, they're going to be raised up in immortality. When, the sat- when Satan comes accusing, his accusation will have nothing in us. All those who did believe on Jesus and they're raised up in a body of death, Satan's accusation is going to have something in them because they're not going to have the Spirit of the living God. They're going to see their nakedness will be uncovered. Satan's going to be there to uncover the nakedness. Right? That's the gospel. Amen. How will you believe on the Father? Is if you see you have one. <laughs> How did God show you He has you have one? Jesus. Sometimes we only see Jesus. We we lose sight of Jesus is the Word made flesh. We lose sight of that. We lose sight of God's talking to me. What is He saying? What is He saying there? Right? I was trying to find the Scripture. Maybe someone in the room knows where it is. I thought it was in Revelation. About, about the sons of God walking by and seeing Satan and saying, is this the cute little thing we were afraid of? And we don't have to wait till then to experience that. We can actually probably others in the room like I am thinking about things in my past that really bothered me. And now I look at like that's that was nothing. But when you see it from a different perspective, you say, My understanding was so uh, perverted and skewed and, and, and uh, based on deception then, no wonder I hurt. Now I can look back and feel no hurt because I see it I see the truth of the matter. Yeah. So you can walk by Satan in the end and say that, that's like a, a wounded puppy that has no power over me. <laughs> just walk right past it. Yeah. So, so we can experience that now. Yeah. We, can walk, like, we can walk right past the accusations right now. Yeah, just like Jesus did. Yeah. The accusation had the prince of this world has nothing in him. Now the hour has come. The prince of this world was judged. What was his accusation was judged against? God come and prove his accusation was baseless. God come and prove that what he said, when he said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and he said it was very good, God came and proved it was true. God came and proved that when he got down on one knee and called Adam his son, he came and proved it was true. He came and proved that it wasn't a lie. He wasn't a lie. Satan is the father of lies. What does Satan come to tell people? That they're orphans. That's right. And they're without a father. Now, is that the truth? No. Well, I think we preach the gospel many times from the perspective as if it is the truth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Indeed. You know, I, 
I used to hear people talk to me about who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and I was able to kind of go, well, that's Jesus. He's the Son of God. Yeah, he does that. I, I, you know, I can't do that. And I would, like, I was stuck right there. You know, I, I, I would not see the connection of, well, I, I could believe the lie that, okay, yeah, you know, Jesus is taking the beating so that I don't have it. But, but I did not see the connection of, no, there is nothing dark and there is no sin in him. But he took my sin. He took it. it. It's like the whole thing with the scapegoat that the Jews were doing. It's like that was put on that thing and sent away. And I mean, that was a huge change for me to be thinking in terms of he came to put that stuff away, to take it out of me, to take it away. You know, not not to take my beating, not to. I mean, now I really can say, yes, I'm dead on that cross. That's that's all my lack, all my all the accusations, everything that I ever thought that would not, you know, be unto life or be lovable. He just buried it. You know, it, I know it's a subtle little nuance, but man, it's 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 something that I didn't know I was stuck on. You know, you, you just you just don't know where you're stuck sometimes. Um, but on the whole book of Job, as soon as you mentioned, boy, this happened on the Day of Atonement, I was like, the restoration of all things. Boy, that changes the story right from the get-go. Yeah. You know? It, it's like it's like I'm not going to have to suffer through all these pages of trying to figure out, what are you doing, God? <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, from day, from the very first chapter, I'm going... God's gonna fix all this, you know. I mean, I, I mean, I want that to be the, the main, highlighted in bold, subtitle, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the, we hadn't understood how, and I still think we struggle to understand this, but we hadn't understood the human heart and God's heart. We hadn't understood the effect of death on the heart, yeah. so we didn't understand the power behind God conquering the death why he had to conquer the death, then the effect that has on our heart. If you can't really call out to God unless you think he's conquered your death. Yeah. It's, it's, it's impossible. Right. Right? right? You have to have the spirit that overcomes death dwelling in you. Or you at least have to first hear it and then call upon the name of God. You have to first see that the spirit of God has overcome your death. That God has come and conquered your death. Right? That enables you to call upon the name of the Lord. We haven't understood the... It's like we think God had to remove our death so He could like us. That's not why God had to remove our death. He had to remove our death because in the day He comes to be with us, there's going to be someone there accusing us. And if the death hasn't been removed, the accusation is going to overcome us. He didn't remove the death so He could believe that we were beautiful. He did remove the death so He could believe we were a treasure. He did remove the death so he could believe that we were his father. He removed the death because he is our father. And he wanted to have a relationship with us. A father-son, a father-daughter relationship. And the only way he could have that, the only way we would engage with him, is if our death could be overcome. Put another way, he, he removed the evidence that was used in the case against us. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. And now we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us. It's not that I say G Satan had nothing in Jesus and now I'm going to go do that too. It's that because I believed on Jesus, the Spirit of Jesus is dwelling in me and every time the prince of this world tries to come and accuse me, the, the, the Spirit of Jesus rises up in my heart. And you know what it says? The Lord rebuke you, Satan. He's a brand plucked out of the fire. And so it's like the Spirit of the living God dwells in me rebuking the accusation of the serpent. I don't go out and try to intellectually rebuke it myself. I don't say, well, I see that Greg said that the serpent had nothing in Jesus and now um, that means he doesn't, he doesn't have anything in us and so now I'm going to go forward and do that. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. There's a Spirit of the living God. When you believe on Jesus, it's like the voice of the Father. Jesus is the Word, isn't He? Yes. Well, the voice of the Father is dwelling in your heart. And when the prince of this world comes to accuse you, if you listen closely, you can hear the voice of the Father saying, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. 
Greg is a brand that's been plucked out of the fire of the second death. I've removed his iniquity and I've clothed him with a raiment. Right? <laughs> There's so many different ways to explain it. You can explain this how it looks in our human heart. You can explain it in actuality, in the spirit of prophecy, the way it's going to look in the end. You can explain the, the, the revelation of what it looks like at the cross. You can explain all the instances in the Old Testament and with Adam. I mean, was Adam an unbeliever after he ate from the tree? Yes, he was. He ate from the tree. He was in unbelief. He clothed upon himself. Was he an unbeliever? When Adam was clothing upon himself, was he believing in God? No. No. What was he believing in? Himself. himself. Now, was he without a father? No. Was he an orphan? No. Was he forsaken by God? No. How do we know? God came and clothed upon him. So, Adam's nakedness was uncovered. That accused him. (coughs) Told him God wasn't his father. He was an orphan. God left him. What are you going to do, bro? Look at your nakedness. He started trying to clothe himself. But Adam wasn't actually without a father because God came to clothe upon Adam. God came to tear down the accusation. He tore down the accusation by clothing upon Adam. And now Adam's heart could call upon the name of the Lord because he could see, I'm not an orphan. I'm not without a father. Right? Right? I have someone to clothe upon me. So in the grand scheme of things, if you ask me if Adam believed, is, a, is, a, is a believer in the sense that did he believe? My answer would be yes, he did believe. Not initially, But my answer would be, after he was clothed upon, he did believe. Mm -hmm. Because who taught Abel? And who taught Seth? Right? But how did he come to be a believer? God came and tore down the accusation. How did he tear down the accusation? Clothing upon him with the lambskin. That's right. God preached the gospel to him. And what would the gospel sound like to Adam? See, we, we lose sight of this. We see more of God as a person between him and Adam. But here's Adam. He thinks he's been forsaken. He thinks he doesn't have a father. He thinks he's an orphan. His nakedness has been uncovered. His nakedness is accusing him. And now he's been put in bondage to laboring and toiling through the fear of death. God would come, and what would God say? Adam, I'm your father. Who told you you were naked? I've never forsaken you. I've never hid my face from you. I've never orphaned you in the earth. You don't have to care for your own life. Look. Bam. Oh. See how God came and challenged the accusation? He tore it down. And when He tore down the accusation, Adam could see that he did have a father. Then he could call upon the name of the Lord. Right? I think that's a big thing because it says they were naked, but they were not ashamed. And the devil comes and tries to shame you that you're naked. And get you to do something. No, God wants you to clothe yourself. You know what I mean? You shouldn't be naked. God has given you right. all things that pertain to life and godliness. And now you got to bring it forth. That's the gospel that's being preached in the world. That God's given you everything in the Spirit. Now to the degree you believe in it, you'll see it in your life. And it strips the relationship with God. You don't come to God. Because you think, i got to bring this forth. He's giving it to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, i got to take the kingdom by force. Mm. You know what I mean? That's the end of the subversion of it. Amen. What a great question. That's why you got to hear this gospel, not yeah. that gospel. And you, listen, you guys have heard me preach the gospel in a number of different ways. This isn't what I'm talking about now with the accusation. This isn't the only way to preach the gospel. But when you get into the nitty-gritty of the heart... You start explaining what happened in the human heart. This is a very big way of explaining it. (coughs) Right? And when God is revealed to be your friend, your advocate, guess what happens? You call upon the name of the Lord. (laughs) You see what I'm saying? It says the Spirit of God leads you to the place where you call Him Father. How does He lead you to that place? He comes and shows you you weren't without a father. Look, He conquered your death. He raised Jesus up in the life. That's what He's going to do with you. Oh, Abba. I think, I think so many, in my experience is that so many churches I've been in, 
have built walls around God and have pushed him further and further away. And the message of this gospel brings him right here with us. Yeah. And that's a huge, huge difference. Yeah. It's, it, it's actually what will put your flesh to rest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what will put your flesh to rest. How was Jesus' flesh put to rest? Right? Ask yourself that. Yeah. What, what put Jesus' flesh to rest? What put Adam to rest? Mm-hmm. After he was laboring and toiling. What does Hebrews 2 say put us in bondage to laboring and toiling? The fear of death. What does it say that Jesus came and did? Destroyed the power of, destroyed him who had the power of death. How did he destroy him? He destroyed death. So he destroyed Satan's power by conquering the death. Well, Satan's only power was that he could accuse. And if he, we no longer have death as being clothed in death, telling us we're not a father, that we're without a father, then he has no power. He's been judged. He's been cast down. His only power was to accuse. And now we see his accusation was a lie. Yeah. God come and conquer death. He did a work to conquer our death. That must mean he's our father. He's come and claimed us as our own, as his own. Now that destroys the, him who had the power of death. Now he has no power to put us in bondage to labor and toil. Right? It's like if my friend down the street come and told me when I was six years old, listen, man, it's turning dark. You better get home and make yourself some dinner. You better get home and start paying the bills. No, man. My mom and dad are there. My mom makes me dinner every night. My dad is working his ass off paying the bills. I don't have to do that, bro. You can't put me in bondage to thinking I have to go do that. I know I have a father and a mother. You see, so Satan no longer had any power. Because the father came and overcame the thing that was taking us from rest. And he gave us the thing we were laboring and toiling to get as a gift. Mm -hmm. And so now, Satan's accusation is powerless to take me from rest and put me in bondage to labor and toiling. Because I see God's done the work. And if he's done the work, then the work isn't needed to be done. Well, if the work isn't needed to be done, guess what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to work. I'm not going to trust in my works. That's, that's, uh, I don't think the church has to understand what it means that you're the righteousness of God. You, with your parents taking care of you, you're their righteousness. Yeah. You know what I mean? We we it made it this spiritual thing like, oh, I'm the righteousness of God. No, that means that God will follow your life. Yep. You know, He will t- He will bring forth His life in you. Yeah. It's not this thing where you have to convince yourself that you're right with God, and now bring forth His Spirit. No, He will. You're His righteousness. Yeah. You know, He will clothe you. Yeah. God is righteous as Abba. Mm-hmm. Right. And now when you call upon the name of Abba, His righteousness will be seen in you being raised up unto glory and immortality. Yes. Jesus is the righteousness of God. How is He the righteousness of God? God's righteousness as Father was seen when He raised Him from the dead and clothed Him in glory and immortality. That's what it means. This, like, like Jared said, for so long we thought the, right, we, the righteousness of God meant that now we're pretty to God. We were <laughs> ugly to God, now we're pretty. He did abhor us, now He accepts us. Right. <laughs> uh, good stuff, guys. Good stuff. Um, Denise asks if we 